Uh, we'd like to welcome Dr. Ann Bass from the Hospital for Special Surgery for her grand rounds on inflammation and thrombosis. Dr. Bass received her medical degree from Columbia University College of Physicians and Surgeons. She completed her residency at New York Presbyterian Columbia University Medical Center, followed by a rheumatology fellowship at New York University Medical Center. She now serves as director of the HSS Rheumatology Fellowship Program and an associate professor of clinical medicine at Cornell Medical College. Her research focuses on thrombotic and cardiovascular complications of orthopedic surgery, and we're lucky to have her today. So if we can just give her a warm welcome. Thanks very much for having me. Uh, so I'm going to be talking about inflammation and thrombosis, uh, touching on rheumatology as I go along. Uh, these are my disclosures. I will be briefly talking about statins. So I'm going to intersperse this talk with some cases. I'm going to talk about the relationship between rheumatic disease activity and thrombosis, uh, between innate immunity and coagulation, between inflammation and atherosclerosis. Um, I'll touch on some perioperative considerations, and if there's time at the end, uh, I'll talk about the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome. So I'll start with a case. This is a 55-year-old man admitted complaining of fever, cough, and weight loss. His white count is 14.7, hemoglobin 9.8, platelets 543,000. He's got a renal insufficiency, creatinine 1.9, and an active urine sediment, 3 plus protein, 2 plus blood, and red cell casts. On chest x-ray is a cavitary lung lesion, which you can see on CT as well. Cultures are completely negative. Sputum for bacteria, AFB, fungus, blood and urine cultures are negative as well. He has a renal biopsy and it shows a crescentic glomerulonephritis. So for those of you who are not nephrologists, here's the glomerulus, renal arteriole, and this crescent-shaped thing here is a cellular crescent. See these nice open capillary loops here, but you don't see them open here in area of ischemia. Uh, so it's a crescentic glomerulonephritis. I'm not showing you immunofluorescence, but the immunofluorescence was negative. So we call this a posse immune glomerulonephritis, crescentic glomerulonephritis. The patient is C ANCA positive, and on confirmatory testing, proteinase 3 antibodies are positive. You see the cytoplasmic staining here versus perinuclear. So the combination of a cavitary lung lesion, glomerulonephritis, uh, posse immune, and C. anco, a diagnosis of granulomatous polyangiitis, which we used to call Wegener's, is made. And this is a condition where there's an inflammation of the small and medium-sized vessels, uh, and also granulomatous inflammation of various organs. So the patient is treated with pulse uh, methylprednisolone for three days and given IV rituximab. And this is on the basis of the RAVE trial, which was published uh, almost seven years ago, or seven years ago, uh, where they randomized uh, almost 200 ANCA-positive vasculitis patients to rituximab compared to PO cyclophosphamide, which was the standard of care at the time, uh, plus their background steroids, and they demonstrated that rituximab was non-inferior. In fact, the outcomes were a little bit better in the rituximab group. So on day seven of admission, the patient's feeling better, chest X-rays improving. But on day eight, he complains of new pleuritic chest pain. So what is the most likely cause of his chest pain? Is it his granulomatous polyangiitis? Is it pneumonia, PE, or myocardial infarction? So to get at this question, uh, you have to look back at an older trial, uh, 2005, uh, which was un uh, unfortunately an unsuccessful trial. Again, almost 200 ANCA-positive vasculitis patients, uh, where they added a tanercept, um, a TNF inhibitor, uh, versus placebo to background treatment, which could be cyclophosphamide or methotrexate, and they were all on prednisone. Um, and unfortunately, it was a negative trial. There was no benefit from the intanercept, and in fact, there were a lot of adverse outcomes, including six solid cancers, and from this we learned, don't combine TNF inhibitors with cyclophosphamide. And interestingly, several patients de developed venous thromboembolism early in the trial, and uh, in fact, 9% of them had their first VTE during the study, and they uh, did a secondary analysis where they showed that the rate of VTE in this, in this group was 7 per 100 person years, as compared to uh, what's estimated to be about 0.3 per 100 person years in the general population, so dramatic uh, increase. And most of these episodes of VTE occurred during active disease or within two, two months of flare. 
Um, and since then, this has been demonstrated in other cohorts. Uh, this is a registry from uh, Denmark, almost 200 patients with uh, GPA, followed for up to seven years, or a mean of, uh, median of seven years, compared to age and sex max controls. And they looked at uh, the incidence rate of stroke as a kind of an, another control, um, PE and DVT. And what you can see is that uh, within the first two years um, of follow-up, the rate of PE and DVT was 20 to 25 times uh, greater than the controls, but not so for arterial thrombosis. And then over time, that rate uh, diminished. Uh, this similar study in the Netherlands, almost 200 GPA patients, asked the question not so much about timing, but active, activity of disease versus inactive disease, um, and showed, as you might expect, a sevenfold greater rate of VTE when the disease was active compared to during quiescent disease. So is this unique to GPA, or is this a feature of all autoimmune diseases? Um, so this has been addressed in a couple of studies. This is a large a study done uh, with a very large Swedish uh, database in the Netherlands. As you know, they have national uh, healthcare systems, and, and really they, their, their database includes the entire population. Um, and uh, in this paper, they asked the question, what is the rate of VTE in the first year after a patient is actually hospitalized for their autoimmune disease? And in fact, they looked at about 30 different autoimmune diseases. I've just selected a few uh, to show you here. But basically, they showed that pretty much every autoimmune disease, when that's the reason for admission, um, increases your rate of VT over the subsequent year. So this is polymyositis, dermatomyositis, lupus, and GPA. And then over time, uh, those rates go down. British National Health Service, same results. Dermato and polymyositis, PAN, lupus, three to five fold higher rates uh, and increased rates even in inflammatory arthritis, although to a lesser degree, same with Sjogren's and scleroderma. So the relationship between rheumatic disease activity and venous thromboembolism suggests that inflammation may be the underlying link. And to kind of get at why this might be, I'll take you back to um, uh, what is the mechanism behind um, thrombosis and hemostasis. And, and I'll make a distinction between hemostasis and thrombosis. So hemostasis is really the physiologic um, process that happens uh, uh, to enable your body to heal a vessel that's been nicked. You walk into the corner of the table, you get a bruise, you don't want to bleed out. Um, so how does, the, how does the body repair? So normally the endothelial cells line here in pink is the lumen and blue is the, um, the vessel wall. So normally the endothelial cells are relatively uh, inactive, um, allow the circulating blood, they don't potentiate coagulation, but the minute you have a break in the vessel, the underlying tissue uh, allows the exposure of a variety of proteins. So on the one hand, you get exposure of von Willebrand factor and collagen, and that allows or causes platelets to adhere and come to this area of injury. And on the other hand, also, uh, there's expression or uh, exposure of tissue factor, which is shown with these double lines here, which induces um, activation of factor seven and then the coagulation cascade. Um, and these platelets that have adhered and stopped in the area uh, don't actually become activated until they are, come in contact with thrombin, and then the combination of the coagulation system and the platelets come together to form a hemostatic plug. Um, it fills that um, area. No, we no longer have exposure of these proteins. Uh, the area gets sealed off, end of story, uh, and um, uh, you move on. But thrombosis is obviously a very different story. We don't want every time you walk into the corner of the table to develop a DVT. So this turns out to actually be a slightly different or uh, a, um, a slightly different process. It's really a pathological process uh, that has very distinct features from uh, hemostasis. Um, and this, I'm sure you all remember from medical school, I assume they still teach it in medical school, um, Virchow's triad, the, the, the um, features that put somebody at risk for developing venous thromboembolism, and they include endothelial injury, uh, stasis or abnormal blood flow, and hypercoagulability. Um, and we know now that inflammation can actually um, induce um, several pieces of this, this pyramid. So inflammation can induce endothelial cell activation even in the absence of injury. Um, and inflammation can also induce hypercoagulability. Um, and not only does inflammation cause endothelial cell activation, but the reverse happens as well. So endothelial cell activation itself initiates recruitment of innate immune cells. 
And I'm going to show this for those of you who don't live in the immunology world and may not be totally clear on what innate immunity is. Um, just to back up for a minute, your immune system has uh, really two challenges. One is to act very quickly in response to infection or um, pathogens. Uh, and the other is to target those path pathogens very specifically because you don't want a lot of bystander damage. And there's a little bit of a um, um, uh, kind of, you can't do both at the same time. So the adaptive immune system or delayed type hypersensitivity is that delayed but very specific arm of the immune system. But innate immunity is really the part that acts very fast, very immediately to uh, invading pathogens. And it includes mast cells, natural killer cells, uh, eosinophils, neutrophils, um, and uh, macrophages and dendritic cells, which also serve as the bridge to the adaptive immune system. And then there are also important features like fever, your skin barriers, and proteins like complement um, and cytokines. So this is what we mean when we talk about innate immunity. So thrombosis is a pathological process that involves active participation of monocytes, neutrophils, dendritic cells. Um, these cells help to initiate and propagate fibrin formation, um, enhance tissue factor expression, and trigger platelet activation, and this combined uh, function of the immune and thrombotic systems uh, was coined immunothrombosis. This is, uh, anybody who wants to read about this, is a beautiful review article by uh, Engelman and Massberg. So why does this happen? I mean, why should we have a system that induces DVT? We don't really want this. Um, so as it turns out, um, innate immune, the innate immune and coagulation systems actually uh, share evolutionary links and um, Possibly the origins of the coagulation system wasn't really to protect us from bleeding, but rather to contribute to host defense. And then it came to have these other, other roles in more advanced uh, organisms. So how does this work? Um, so coagulation promotes immune defense uh, in the following ways, or these are just some of them. So number one, fibrin traps bacteria. So when you get a wound, bacteria comes in. Um, as that clot is formed, the fibrin actually traps the bacteria, limits their ability to spread, and fibrin also uh, appears to have some direct antimicrobial effects. And if you use an experimental model of a mouse that uh, has decreased tissue factor expression, and then you infect those mice with uh, gram-negative bacteria, they have an increased pathogen burden and decreased host survival. So this is um, a demonstration in vivo that uh, tissue factor expression is actually important for host defense. Platelets also have a dual role, so they can bind microorganisms uh, and become activated by those organisms. They re release damps, uh, danger signals uh, that trigger innate immunity when they're bound to bacteria or activated, otherwise activated. Uh, their products can initiate the complement cascade, and platelets can bind to neutrophils and trigger the formation of nets, which are these histone uh, and protein-rich um, nets that are released by activated uh, neutrophils that also contribute to host uh, defense. But not only does coagulation promote immune defense, immune activation triggers coagulation in the other direction. So uh, activated monocytes express tissue factor, uh, and neutrophil nets themselves actually activate coagulation. Uh, and this is a beautiful picture of uh, neutrophils having spewed out their nets, uh, and they contain proteins that activate factor 12, bind tissue factor, bind von Willebrand factor, and trigger platelet activation. And there are also enzymes that cleave natural anticoagulants and potentiate coagulation. And this is just a little cartoon showing platelets binding to pathogens, uh, activating complement, monocytes also expressing tissue factor as they're activated, um, uh, a variety of proteins that um, uh, potentiate coagulation and reduce fibrinolysis. And here's the little clot that forms, um, and that can progress to a DVT. And uh, in fact, um, uh, this systematic literature review demonstrated that in patients admitted to the hospital with infection, um, their rate of VTE is anywhere from two to five fold higher. And I'll just mention a kind of a, a nice um, experiment of nature. Uh, which is Bechet's disease. So Bechet's is a, a condition, rare condition here, uh, more common along the silk route, uh, affects men more than women, typically onset in the 30s. Um, it's associated with HLA-B51, 
which is more prevalent along the silk route, which is why you see it more there. Uh, these patients have oral and genital ulcers, uveitis, you can see this hypopion here, um, and arthritis, but up to a third of them uh, have vascular involvement, uh, usually in the first five years of disease. And in this condition, the veins are much more affected than the arteries, with the exception of the pulmonary artery, which is a vein-like artery, low-pressure low artery. Um, and these patients can have DVT, Bud Chiari, IVC occlusion, dural vein thrombosis, portal vein thrombosis, uh, and pulmonary artery aneurysms. And what's interesting is that these uh, thrombosis uh, in this condition is really adherent to the vessel wall. It doesn't um, seem to, they don't seem to embolize. And um, studies suggest that uh, uh, in treatment of thrombosis, what's really critical is to use immunosuppression, steroids, azathioprine, TNF inhibitors, whatever you're going to treat that patient with. And there doesn't seem to be any benefit from anticoagulation. So I'm not suggesting that when you have a patient with DBT, you should give them steroids and not give them heparin. But uh, this is just to point out that in, in an extreme case like Bichette's, um, inflammation alone is enough to uh, induce um, uh, an adherent clot. So in our first case of the patient with GPA, I would argue that PE would be at the top of my list, um, although clearly these other uh, conditions uh, are in your differential diagnosis. Okay, so I'll move to case two. This is a 72-year-old man with a 40-year history of erosive seropositive rheumatoid arthritis. He's on methotrexate and low-dose prednisone. And the reason he's not on more aggressive therapy is because he's had a history of recurrent infections when on biologic agents. He has no other medical problems. And on exam, he has joint deformities and rheumatoid nodules. There's mild synovitis in a few joints, and his CDI, which is a, a marker of disease activity, is 15, which is moderate disease activity. So not well controlled. So what is this patient most likely to die of? Rheumatoid vasculitis, infection, myocardial infarction, pulmonary embolism, or interstitial lung disease. So RA is one of the most common rheumatic diseases, 1% of the population worldwide, um, twice as many women as men. Um, and about 60% of patients are seropositive, about half have rheumatoid factor, half have CCP, and there's some overlap in that Venn diagram, but 30% are seronegative. Uh, risk factors include smoking, and uh, HLA uh, DR beta 1 star 04. Um, uh, this HLA molecule has uh, what we call the shared epitope. These are four specific amino acids that are present in the antigen binding groove of the HLA molecule, suggesting that there's a particular antigen, maybe a citronellated protein, that drives this disease. Produces a symmetrical polyarthritis involving the large and small joints, classically the MCP and PIP joints, as you can see here. Actually, these PIPs are not so swollen. The wrist is swollen here. And it's erosive. So this is a kind of famous series of uh, x-rays showing nice carpal bones and MCP joints, maybe some narrowing there. And then over time, loss of erosions and, and destruction of the carpal bones uh, over time. And here you see also destruction of the MCP joints. But we've known for a very long time, um, and this is really a seminal paper uh, published by Ted Pincus um, almost, almost 30 years ago, scary to think, now. Um, and this is what he showed, which was, um, he looked at his, this was before the days of CDIs and hacks, and so we didn't really have good uh, damage markers, but he divided his patients up in this cohort between those uh, on the basis of how well they could carry out their activities of daily living, which is kind of comparable to a hack. And so these two lines here represent the people who are functional. And then these two lines here are the patients who were um, very limited in their ability to carry out their normal activities. And this is over a 100-month period, so a, a long stretch of time. Um, and, and what you can see is that 50% of the patients in this uh, uh, low-function group were dead by um, you know, three or four, four or five years. And what he demonstrated in this paper was he showed comparable curves from other uh, cohorts that the life expectancy in this group was comparable to somebody with stage four Hodgkin's disease or with three vessel coronary disease back then. And this was really uh, um, an eye opener because here we were worried about their joints and what we realized was that our patients were dying. 
Um, and over the years since then, it's become apparent that this excess mortality uh, really comes from cardiovascular disease. So this is one of uh, many, many studies. This was Dan Solomon uh, showing that the rate of cardiovascular mortality in rheumatoid arthritis patients uh, was significantly higher than that in non-RA patients. Um, and again, a cohort study comparing RA patients to diabetes, uh, patients with diabetes, uh, their uh, risk, their, rel their uh, excess risk uh, of cardiovascular disease was about 70%. It's comparable to patients with diabetes. Um, and these two diseases together were, uh, had um, synergy, uh, synergistic risk. So the, the relative risk went up to 2.6. Um, and we know now that rheumatoid arthritis patients compared to controls have more coronary artery calcification, more carotid intima media thickness, more arterial plaque, and the traditional cardiovascular risk factors don't fully account for their increase in atherosclerosis. Um, and this is, another, this is another study actually applying the Framingham cardiovascular risk score to over 500 RA patients and looking at the predicted risk um, versus in black the actual rate of events. And you can see that there are many black bars that are higher than the white bars. Um, Dan Solomon again asked the question, well, does this relate to just the diagnosis or does this relate to disease activity? Um, and he demonstrated very nicely that it really was a marker of disease activity. So he looked in the Corona database, which is a database with almost 25,000 patients followed and really in community practices. And the practitioners are expected to collect disease activity measures at every visit. Um, and he looked at kind of an area under the curve, what was the um, time average CDI or time averaged um, disease activity for these patients over the time that they were followed. And in the, um, just look at model C. Uh, the um, patients with high disease activity are considered a hazard ratio of one. And then by comparison, as you can see, a stepwise lowering uh, risk of cardiovascular disease uh, the, the less and less active the disease became. And he looked at subsets, um, and obviously the numbers get smaller, so the, the error bars uh, cross uh, each other, but you can see still it didn't matter whether you looked at the subset of patients with cardiovascular disease or not, on steroids not, on NSAIDs or not, still you saw this division between high disease activity between not and not high disease activity, uh, there being a much higher rate of cardiovascular disease. So disease activity seems to be associated with cardiovascular risk. And it shouldn't be surprising because kind of in parallel, the cardiologists are becoming rheumatologists, and they've discovered or shown uh, in a variety of studies that elevated IL-6 levels, this is a meta-analysis, um, are associated with uh, future cardiovascular events, a relative risk of 1.25. So why is this? Uh, well, I mean, this is not a new story anymore, but uh, as many of you know, inflammation is associated with atherosclerosis or atherosclerosis. Um, and we know that activated macrophages with, within athero, uh, atherominous plaques release IL-1. Uh, which results in many, many things, including smooth muscle proliferation and the recruitment of additional inflammatory cells. Um, and uh, where does IL-1 come from? Well, IL-1 comes uh, from macrophages and results from the activation of the inflammasome. Um, and then this is, again, a little bit of background immunology. This is showing the surface of a cell. Um, this is the inflammasome. There are a variety of molecules that come together. And the function of the inflammasome is to convert preformed pro-IL-1 beta that's sitting there ready to go and convert it to IL-1, uh, which causes fever, all the things you associate with kind of an acute inflammatory response. And uh, typically in immune reactions to pathogens, um, this, this activation of the inflammasome occurs through um, triggering of toll-like receptors. So um, these can be uh, gram-negative, gram-positive bacteria triggering uh, cell surface uh, toll-like receptors. Viruses can trigger intracellular toll-like receptors, a variety of intracellular events uh, occur, leading to activation of NF-kappa B and activation of the inflammasome. But as it turns out, you can actually bypass this. Certain molecules can bypass this, including uric acid crystals, alum that's used as a, uh, an, an adjunct to, to vaccines, or used to be. Um, and as it turns out, cholesterol can be engulfed and directly activate the inflammasome, leading to the production of IL-1.
Uh, and this is just a cartoon um, showing uh, the development of atherosclerotic plaque. You have activated endothelial cells with their little uh, proteins uh, recruiting mononuclear cells that come into the vessel wall, engulf lipids that activate them further. They recruit lymphocytes. They induce uh, 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 smooth muscle proliferation. They're kind of uh, overstuffed with these lipids. They release lipids along with their enzymes and uh, ultimately lead to rupture of this plaque, uh, thrombosis and then MI or stroke. Um, and as I said, the cardiologists are now becoming rheumatologists um, and there are a number of large and small trials ongoing uh, targeting cytokines, in particular IL-1 and IL-6, for the treatment of cardiovascular disease. Uh, and I'll, I'll mention a few of these because it's actually uh, a very exciting area. So uh, we'll start with IL-6. This is a study that actually chose RA patients um, uh, to study. And um, I'll back up a little bit. Uh, so IL-1, the IL-6 receptor blocker that is currently available for use is tocilizumab. Um, and uh, tocilizumab, one of the side effects is hyperlipidemia. It um, elevates uh, LDL cholesterol, but also HDL. So there's always been this question, well, you control the RA, so you should make a cardiovascular risk go down, but you're elevating lipids, you know, what's the net effect? And of course, the drug maker is very anxious to show that, that their drug um, reduces cardiovascular risk. So in this study, they took 3,000 RA patients and they uh, compared tocilizumab to a tenorcept, which is a TNF inhibitor, which we know reduces cardiovascular risk. And I know they were hoping to show that tocilizumab would be as good or better. Um, they selected RA patients with elevated CRP, and they had to have at least one cardiovascular risk factor. Um, this study was completed in 2016, but I have not been able to find the results, which leads me to surmise that it was a negative study. I can't say that for sure, but all I can say is that the study is done, but I don't know the results. Um, the CERT trial is a large study uh, in 7,000 uh, patients being run by Paul Ridker, who's kind of the maven of uh, the inflammatory hypothesis of cardiovascular disease. And in this study, they're actually using methotrexate uh, to treat patients with cardiovascular disease. So stable coronary disease plus um, either diabetes or metabolic syndrome to kind of um, choose a high risk population. The outcome is major adverse cardiovascular events and uh, they uh, are still uh, enrolling and um, this study is uh, slated to be complete in 2019. Methotrexate is thought to block indirectly IL-6, IL-1, and a whole variety of other pathways. What about IL-1 blockade? So um, the cheapest, oldest IL-1 blocker is colchicine. It has a lot of effects, but it does appear to block uh, um, the inflammasome, which may be one of the reasons it's helpful in gout. And this is an old, well actually it's not so old, 2013 study, um, which was, had a very peculiar design, um, so you have to take it with a grain of salt, but a very dramatic result. So they took, five, this is in England, they took 500 patients with coronary disease, and they randomized them to daily colchicine versus placebo. But after the randomization, they just told the patient's cardiologist, prescribe colchicine daily, or no. Um, so it wasn't blinded. Um, and then they followed them. Um, so it was a cheap study to do, and they showed really a dramatic outcome. The patients on colchicine, the hazard ratio for cardiovascular events was 0.33, so quite dramatic. And a hint that maybe IL-1 blockade is important. Um, this uh, more recently published pilot study in patients uh, being admitted with acute ST segment elevation MI. They used anakinra, which is an IL-1 blocker that we use in um, uh, systemic GIA. Um, and they were looking for a reduction in um, recurrent ischemia. Their, that result was negative. They showed no difference in ischemic events. Um, but at, in a secondary outcome of death or new onset heart failure, there was actually a dramatic reduction with anakinra. So a hint that maybe it's helpful, but just uh, pilot data. Uh, and then there's the Canto study. So this is the Paul Ritker's other study. Um, he actually originally wanted to do this study with colchicine, but I don't know if you know the whole lawsuit, Takeda lawsuit, um, it's not worth going into the details, but the bottom line was that he was told, you'll never be able to do a study with 10,000 patients using colchicine, um, so just use an IL-1 blocker. So canakinumab is a very long-acting IL-1 blocker, again, used in systemic GIA, and they are randomizing 10,000 patients to various doses of canakinumab versus placebo. Um, uh, these patients all have a history of MI and an elevated CRP, and their outcome is major adverse cardiovascular events. 
And just a few weeks ago, Novartis published on their website a press release suggesting that this, uh, this study has actually had a positive result. It has not been presented anywhere. I can't give you any of the details, but um, it looks like uh, this, this may be uh, marketed. Uh, this drug costs about $50,000 a year. So clearly, if it's going to be applied to patients with cardiovascular disease, there's going to have to be some uh, change in the pricing, um, which I certainly would hope would have a ripple effect on other biologics. But uh, this will be a very interesting story to follow. Um, and then I mentioned I would touch on statins. Um, we've actually been using anti-inflammatory drugs in cardiovascular disease for a very long time now um, in the form of statins. So we think of statins as being medicines that lower cholesterol, um, but I would argue that their more important effect um, in ameliorating cardiovascular disease is their, are their cholesterol independent effects. Um, which are in large part uh, anti-inflammatory. So um, I'll just take you back to medical school. Um, so uh, to make cholesterol, you start with acetyl-CoA, and uh, along the way, you require HMG-CoA reductase, which is blocked by statins. And so you lower your cholesterol by blocking this enzyme. But as it turns out, um, there are other molecules along this pathway that are actually very, very important in many physiological systems, uh, including inflammatory ones. Um, so these, this geronyl and farnesyl pyrophosphate, these molecules turn out to be donors of, prenylated, uh, uh, of prenyl groups to prenylated proteins. And why is this important? So these prenylated proteins or isoprenoids, um, or these prenyl groups, which are also called isoprenoids, are required for the activation of small GTP aces that are critical uh, in inflammatory signaling pathways. And I'll give you an example. This is a cartoon. So one of these small GTP aces is rho GTP. So um, uh, in, this, in this cartoon, you have a mitogen or a cytokine or a genotoxin comes in and binds to the cytokine receptor. Um, it activates rho GTP ace, and then there are downstream effects which lead to all of these cell survival, inflammation, fibrosis, all the things that you want to happen when that cytokine signals. Um, but you see this little Z-shaped uh, molecule here that's attaching the road GTPase to this, the inner side of the cell membrane. So as it turns out, that's a, that's a prenyl group. So in order to get rho GD, uh, GTP to dock on the uh, inner cell membrane, you need this prenyl group. So if you take a statin and you block production of those prenyl groups, you reduce this docking activity. And this is one of many anti-inflammatory effects or mechanisms of the anti-inflammatory effects of statins. Um, prenylation is important in uh, not just for Rho, but RAC, PPAR, ENOS. And then statins have a variety of other direct anti-inflammatory effects on both immune cells and endothelial cells. Um, and this is the Paul Ritker, again, the maven of uh, anti-inflammatory theory of uh, cardiovascular disease, the Jupiter trial, which demonstrated that resuvastatin uh, halved the risk of cardiovascular events in a large cohort of patients that did not have cardiovascular disease, but had CRP levels in the high range of normal. Uh, this is their, the curve every investigator hopes to get. Um, and interestingly, in this study, they also showed uh, uh, having a VTE risk in this population, um, but um, this has been very difficult to replicate in other studies. So back to our earlier patient, a patient with poorly controlled, long-standing rheumatoid arthritis, what is he most likely to die of? Myocardial infarction. Okay, here's a third case. Um, so this is a 75-year-old woman who's had rheumatoid arthritis for 20 years. She's had severe left knee pain for the last year, but her other joints are not inflamed. Uh, in fact, that joint is not inflamed. She has well-controlled RA. She's taking methotrexate and etanercept. She smokes one pack per day of cigarettes, and she's scheduled for a left total knee replacement. So which of the following contributes most to her VTE risk? Is it her rheumatoid arthritis? Is it her orthopedic surgery? Is it her age? Or is it her smoking? So this should look familiar to you from what I talked about earlier. RA patients have a double, uh, double the risk of VTE compared to the general population. So a lot, large cohort published uh, fairly recently, non-RA and RA. But 
If you look at a population that's hospitalized and you ask yourself the question, well, we're talking about in, in, the case of, in this particular case, a patient that's going to undergoing surgery. Um, uh, how do patients undergoing surgery that have RA compare to patients uh, not undergoing surgery that have RA? So um, this was a large cohort, almost a billion patients. So this is, is a huge US uh, database of hospitalized patients. So almost a billion patients of whom about six million had RA and the remainder didn't have RA. Uh, and in this study, they looked at the rate of VTE uh, in the patients that did not have an operation on their joints. And what you can see is, yes, the RA patients have an elevated risk of VTE, 2.3% versus 1.15% in the non-RA population, so that same doubling of risk. But when they looked at the patients that were admitted for an operation on their joints, the rates were identical. And this has been shown in other cohorts. This is a Canadian discharge database looking at patients undergoing arthroplasty, looking at the rate of VTE, OA versus RA. And you can see that actually in the case of hip replacement, the rate of VTE is actually lower in the RA patients. And it's about the same in the knee replacement patients. So what, why this paradox? Well. Not surprisingly, patients with RA who are sent for surgery usually have their disease under good control, and their surgery is actually being done for damage, uh, not for active disease. We treat their active disease medically. And quiet disease doesn't increase VTE risk. Um, but surgery does. And this is, again, one of many studies just to look at the rate of VTE after surgery. Uh, it matters what type of surgery you have, so always topping the list um, is orthopedic surgery. This is just all comers having surgery. So these patients receive prophylaxis. This is not a clinical trial. So receiving prophylaxis, uh, about 1.2% of orthopedic patients have VTE, vascular is next, and then uh, the, the kind of more, less and less invasive, um, the surgery, uh, the lower the risk. Um, and these numbers are comparable this, uh, to uh, what was published in the CHESS guidelines. So every four years, four to six years, uh, CHESS um, uh, publishes guidelines on VT prophylaxis and VT treatment, and um, there's such a big literature on this in orthopedic surgery now, they have a separate issue specifically devoted to orthopedic surgery, and um, this was uh, just their estimate as uh, combining all of the trials. If you have uh, prophylaxis with low micro heparin, what is your rate of VTE after major orthopedic surgery? And in the 35 days after surgery, the rate is about 1.8%. And about two-thirds of those events occur in the first two weeks, and about a third in the second two weeks. And about two-thirds are DVT, and one-third are PE. Um, this is a, a date from the Danish nationwide cohort looking at the causes of death after arthroplasty. Um, you can ignore this top line, which is kind of miscellaneous, which is the majority of the, of the deaths. But here's VTE, and you can see that in the first six weeks or so, um, after surgery, um, it's one of the important causes of death. Um, but of course, anybody looking at this curve will say, well, what, you know, what's this one? And that's MI, and that's the subject of another talk. So that's actually the most important cause of death after orthopedic surgery. So uh, why does surgery trigger VTE? Well, patients are immobilized, although less than they used to be. Um, if you're talking about surgery in general, there may be uh, something related to the underlying reason that they're having their surgery. They might have an infection, they might have cancer. <clears throat> Patients may have tourniquets, especially in orthopedic surgery. Low flow states, um, and they, they often induce hypotensive anesthesia, so low pressure uh, um, and uh, kind of low perfusion. Um, and then there's the surgery itself, which is a form of trauma, particularly orthopedic surgery, which the body experiences as if you were breaking your leg. Um, and trauma, um, happily, induces coagulation. Um, and as it turns out, trauma also induces an inflammatory response. So this is well known. This is, this is a pilot study we did just demonstrating uh, CRP levels before and on uh, surgery and then after surgery post up day two, and IL-6 levels also um, increasing dramatically. Um, and then this is a study done also at HSS um, uh, by the anesthesia group who, who often give steroid decadron or, or steroids to prevent postoperative uh, uh, nausea. Um, and they showed, not surprisingly, this, these were patients undergoing bilateral knee replacement. Uh, here are their IL-6 levels in the postoperative period. And then if you give them steroids, not surprisingly, the IL-6 levels go down. 
Um, but what's interesting is that in a subsequent study that uh, Kathy Jules did, they showed that giving steroids not only does it reduce IL-6, but it reduces pro uh, production of pro uh, prothrombin fragments, i.e., giving steroids reduces um, activation of the coagulation system. Um, another kind of piece of indirect evidence that um, you know, inflammation triggers thrombosis and, and kind of linking it to surgery is, is from this study that I, that I like to show. Um, I'm not going to go into great detail. The, the purpose of this study was actually to show that um, stress responses in mice are different than stress responses in men. The mice are in hatched bars. Um, so you can ignore the hatch bars per, for purposes of this talk. Um, what I like to show this graph for is to, is to point out that the kind of genomic responses to stress, no matter what the stress is, whether it's a burn in red or whether it's trauma, which I use as a kind of an analogy to surgery, or whether it's endotoxemia, the genomic responses, you know, the genes that are, are turned on, are really very similar. Um, and the reason I'm showing this is that not only did they look at which genes were activated in response to those stresses, but they followed patients over time and they asked the question, how long does it take to turn off those activated genes? And it turns out that that actually does differ depending on the type of stress. And so if you look at burns, um, it can, the, the mean is uh, more than three months. If you look at trauma, which again I'm using as an analogy to surgery, it's about one month. Uh, whereas if you look at endotoxemia, it's very rapid. It's, it's within the first day. So you give that patient fluids, antibiotics, pressors, and the next day, they've, they've turned it off. And this one month, interestingly, corresponds to precisely the period in which VTE risk is highest, at least following this is orthopedic surgery. So indirect evidence, but adding another piece to the puzzle. So um, when you have the patient sitting in front of you, they're about to undergo surgery, in particular orthopedic surgery, but, but, which is what I deal with a lot, but, but any type of surgery, what are their patient-specific risk factors? Uh, well, most important uh, is a history of venous thromboembolism, uh, active cancer, estrogen use, smoking, advanced age are all risk factors. Black race increases risk, Asian race seems to be protective. Obesity is a risk. Non-O ABO blood type is a risk. Um, it's associated with elevated factor eight levels. Uh, and then rare thrombophilias. People get very caught up on thrombophilias, but um, uh, it's a very small minority of the patients that actually experience VTE after surgery. And then there, there's surgery specific risk factors. So orthopedic surgery more than other types of surgery is a risk. And then among orthopedic surgery patients, hip fracture patients are at high risk, highest risk. If you have bilateral surgeries, it's higher risk revision surgeries. And if you have general anesthesia versus regional, regional anesthesia, you're at higher risk for VTE. So thinking back to our case, uh, the patient with RA, um, although these other features might uh, increase her risk of VTE after surgery, uh, in her case, it's the orthopedic surgery itself um, that is the strongest risk factor. Okay. And um, this is the final case. Um, this is a 25-year-old woman with lupus who's admitted with acute appendicitis. Uh, in the last three weeks, she's had active arthritis and a male R rash. She's had lupus for five years, manifested by arthritis, photosensitive rash, pericarditis, leukopenia, and thrombocytopenia. Uh, but she has no history of DVT or PE, and she has no history of fetal loss. She's been managed with hydroxychloroquine and intermittent corticosteroids for flares. She saw her rheumatologist the day before admission. She wasn't feeling well. Uh, here she wondered if it um, might be her lupus, sent some serologies off. Um, she has a positive ANA. She has a positive Sjogren's antibody, and she had low complement levels that day. Um, and she was found to have a positive anticardiolipin IgM antibody at 18, normal less than 12. IgG and A were negative, negative lupus anticoagulant. But the next day she comes in, her abdominal pain is worse. She comes in, she has an emergency appendectomy. She's put on prednisone 15 milligrams daily to manage her joint pains and malar rash. Uh, but on postoperative day two, she develops right leg swelling. And on Doppler, she's found to have a superficial femoral DVT. She's treated with low molecular heparin and then converted to warfarin. And so the question is, how long should the warfarin be continued in this patient? Three months, one year, or indefinitely? 
I'll probably get arguments from hematologists in the audience here, but maybe not. Um, so the antiphospholipid antibody syndrome is characterized by venous thromboembolism, uh, in some cases arterial thrombosis, including stroke and MI, um, and in some patients recurrent fetal loss. Some patients have all three, and some people have uh, one, two of, uh, of these three. Uh, antiphospholipid, and the terminology gets confusing. Um, so antiphospholipid antibodies is the, the whole um, collection of antibodies, and these antiphospholipid antibodies include the following. Anticardiolipin antibodies, anti-beta-2 glycoprotein-1 antibodies, because it turns out that these antibodies bind to probably the, the, con the important ones bind to a complex of cardiolipin and beta-2 glycoprotein, and lupus anticoagulant. You can also see a false positive test for syphilis, but it seems to uh, be less important as a risk factor. So anticardiolipin antibodies are seen in 30 to 40 percent of lupus patients, which is why we see the syndrome more commonly in that group of patients, but you don't have to have lupus. Um, and anticardiolipin antibodies are seen in 20 percent of women with recurrent fetal loss. Um, but they're also present in about 10 percent of the general population, particularly the older population, at least at low titer. Much less common uh, are high titer persistent anticardiolipin antibodies or a persistent lupus anticoagulant. Um, and just uh, the lupus anticoagulant is really a misnomer because these patients are at risk for clotting, not uh, bleeding. Um, and just uh, briefly, for, especially for the house staff, um, uh, what a lupus anticoagulant is, is a patient will, will, on screening, have a prolonged APTT. Typically, a prolonged AT, APTT means that you have a, a defect or you're lacking a coagulation factor. So then when you, take, so you do a mixing study, you take somebody else's plasma, normal plasma, and add it, you replace that coagulation factor and you normalize the PTT. So if you have a coagulation defect and you do a mixing study, the PTT should come down to normal. However, in these patients with the lupus anticoagulant, that does not happen. So what they have is not a, uh, uh, they don't have a deficit or a lack of a coagulation factor. What they have is an inhibitor, an antibody, that is interfering with the assay in the test tube. So that's why the PTT is prolonged. This antibody is just getting in the way. So then you can add all the plasma you want, all the coagulation factors you want, that inhibitor is still going to be there. So you're not going to normalize the PTT in a mixing study. So that's what, that's what we mean when we talk about a lupus anticoagulant. So uh, in patients, um, uh, so VT risk varies among patients with antiphospholipid antibodies. So in patients that have anticardiolipin antibodies, the risk is higher if they're persistent than if they're transient. And they're high, it's higher if they're high titer than if they're low titer. And by high titer, we mean uh, at least 40 units. Uh, and by persistent, we mean positive on at least two occasions, 12 weeks apart. I think I just lost. I'll talk loud. Ah, there it is. Came back. <laughs> um, in patients with lupus, uh, in patients with APS, those that have a lupus anticoagulant are at higher risk than those with anticardiolipin antibodies. And the patients that have the triple positivity, that is lupus anticoagulant, anticardiolipin, and anti-beta uh, uh, GP1 antibodies, those are at the highest risk. But having a history of VTE trumps it all. So if you have all of these, but you haven't had a clot yet, or you haven't had a clot period, um, uh, we still don't know if you're going to have a clot, and we certainly don't anticoagulate prophylactically. Um, and in fact, just as in patients that don't have antiphospholipid antibody syndrome, patients with APS usually have, or many of them, or half of them, have a reversible risk factor at the time of thrombosis. So most of these patients don't, half of these patients present with spontaneous thrombosis, but half of them actually have a trigger at the time of their clot, which in 6 to 18 percent is a surgical procedure. And as in the general population, your risk of vascular events increases with increasing number of thrombotic risk factors. So it's not like you have APS or you don't. Within the APS population or the patients with these antibodies, the level of risk is very, very variable from patients that have the antibodies and never clot to patients that have triple positivity and spontaneously clot and have arterial thromboses, et cetera. And obviously, you're going to man you want to manage those patients differently. So what are the VTE risk factors in patients with antiphospholipid antibodies? 
well, what you might expect, comorbidities. There's a higher rate of rheumatic disease, so if their disease is active, that's going to be a risk factor. Obesity, heart failure, varicose veins, exogenous factors like smoking and estrogen, and then intervening factors like infection or surgery. Um, and even in CAPS, catastrophic APS, where you have thrombi in multiple organs, at least two organs at the same time, 50% of these patients presenting with CAPS have a trigger at that time, uh, which is infection in about a third of uh, patients and trauma or invasive procedures in 13%. So um, with, with this often, it's because their anticoagulation is held, but there's usually a trigger. So looking at our patient, um, what are her risk factors for DVT? She has active lupus, she had arthritis, male or rash, low complement levels. She had an infection, she had appendicitis. And then she underwent surgery, although it's a relatively minor surgery, she underwent an appendectomy. What about her APS serologies? Well, she, has, she does have an anticardiolipin antibody, but it's very low titer, definitely under 40, and it's IgM, which probably is lower risk than IgG. She doesn't have a lupus anticoagulant, and she has no history of prior VTE. So, um, and here's where I may get the argument. I would say um, that this patient probably should be treated uh, for three months. Um, uh, but you definitely want to repeat the anticardiolipin testing. It's possible that that was a very transient result related to her infection. Uh, IgM uh, antibodies like rheumatoid factors can rise nonspecifically um, in the context of infection. And as with any patient, you're trying to figure out, should I continue anticoagulation or not, uh, checking a D-dimer level. Uh, at that time uh, will help uh, make that decision. So just to summarize, uh, rheumatic disease patients are at increased risk of VTE at times of active disease. Rheumatoid arthritis disease activity is also a risk factor for atherosclerosis. Atherosclerosis is an inflammatory process. Statins and IL-1 blockers appear to reduce the risk of major adverse cardiovascular events through their anti-inflammatory effects. RA patients with well-controlled disease undergoing orthopedic surgery are not at increased risk for VTE, but don't forget they're non-RA-related risk factors. And anticardiolipin antibodies can occur in the context of infection, and APS patients vary in their VTE risks. Superimposed inflammatory processes can serve as a trigger for VTE, such as infection, rheumatic disease activity, and surgery. I'll stop there. age, and I wonder if you uh, share with us your view of why age is a big deal factor in so many of these uh, syndromes. Uh, that's a very good question, um, <laughs> which I actually haven't thought about. Um, you know, age is a risk factor. Uh, the hazard ratio is not huge. Um, it could be an issue of stasis, you know, uh, venous return depends on um, the function of your leg muscles. Uh, elderly patients may be less active, it may be something as simple as that. Um, uh, uh, age is associated with conditions that may increase um, uh, the level of inflammation in the body, that might be another indirect way, it may be kind of a summation of those things, but it's, a, it's an interesting question. I, I can't answer it directly. Uh, um, the heparins have some intrinsic anti-inflammatory activity. Um, my question is, do you think that the introduction of the NOACs, the novel at all anticoagulants, which are heparinoids and right. eliminate the need for them at all, would play into our choice in patients with these inflammatory conditions? Um, I don't think in, in general inflammatory conditions, but I, where this question comes up a lot, at least in my community, is related to APS patients. Um, so Jane Salmon, who's at HSS, did some uh, studies 10, 15 years ago uh, in a pregnancy model of APS, um, where if you uh, give any, any cardiolipin antibodies to a mouse that's pregnant, you cause fetal loss. Um, and what she showed is you could block that with heparin, which has a long uh, 
a long chain that acts as a complement inhibitor, but you uh, couldn't block that with warfarin and you couldn't block it um, with uh, fonoparinox, which is short and doesn't have that long chain. So from that, you might deduce that, well, we should always be using heparin and not using any other anticoagulant in patients with APS. But in fact, we know that warfarin works. Um, so that's a kind of long-winded way of saying that we have some theoretical ideas. So number one, we do think that inflammation is important in thrombosis, but we haven't really been able to demonstrate in the clinic that heparin is necessarily better than other anticoagulants. In APS, you know, this is a rare disease. We really don't have, we have almost no uh, controlled trials at all. There is worry, especially in these very, very sick APS patients, about trying something new. Um, and there is really only one study of NOACs in APS, and they didn't look at uh, VTE or thrombosis of any kind as their outcome. They used a surrogate outcome, um, which was, um, it was like prothrombin fragments. It was coagulation activation. And they were able to show that that surrogate marker was, you know, as well controlled with NOACs as with, with warfarin. Um, but that's a surrogate marker. Um, and a lot of people think that until we have better data, especially in the, the very sick APS patients, that we should be careful. Um, but these agents are so much easier, and if you have a patient, I, I didn't mention, but you have to, you know, when you're making your decision about anticoagulation, you have to remember that there's a 3% risk of major bleeding per year that a patient is on full dose anticoagulation. So if you have a 25-year-old woman, um, you have to balance that bleeding risk with what you think the thrombotic risk is. And so similarly, if you have a patient who is, you know, has a genotype that makes them very um, warfarin sensitive or very difficult to manage with warfarin, um, their risk of bleeding is going to be high. And you know, absent data, some people might choose, or somebody who's very non-compliant with INR testing, uh, might decide that we don't know, but we think the risk of bleeding is lower with no acts. If I think inflammation ruins logical condition and myocardial infarction, I think psoriasis. So is the risk for RA and psoriasis the same, or is, is there a difference, and is the mechanism similar? Yeah, that's a very good question. Um, so psoriasis um, uh, is a disease that is strongly linked uh, to metabolic syndrome. So, you know, and anybody who takes care of psoriasis patients, psoriatic arthritis patients know they come in, they have truncal obesity, they've got, you know, prediabetes, they've got the whole shebang. And their risk of, of myocardial infarction is quite high. Whether, but the level of inflammation in psoriatic arthritis and psoriasis is probably lower than it is in active RA. You, know, you don't get those sky high inflammatory markers the way you do in, in RA. So to what extent it's the inflammation of the disease and to what extent it's a genetic link to cardiovascular disease, I can't really, I don't think we've teased that out yet. Okay, thank you very much.